I have stated in previous videos that university has occupied most of my time. Last year I was literally bombarded with homework, lectures and exams. Far too often the only time I got to myself was the time I spent sleeping. And so my apologies go out for the apparent lack of video productions lately and the lack of replies to any emails that I have not had the opportunity to respond to. Such is the case with the latest two donations to my noble cause. On May 19, 2014, Maria Demi sent me five Great British Pounds. God bless and fight on. Sorry, can't afford more. Unfortunately, she sent me the money as pay for goods and services, and I was required to accept the money she sent. Regrettably, because of my studies, I don't check my PayPal as frequently as I used to. When I finally signed in, the time had expired and the money was returned. Maria is welcome to resend the money if she wishes. To anyone in future who donates, might I suggest also sending me an email to my usual Gmail letting me know that you've sent the donation. I always check that Gmail, even though I don't always have the time to reply to everything. The next payment was received though. On November 16, 2012, I received 12 euros from Dennis Walsh. For Interstellar, travel safe. Best regards, Dennis Walsh. Ah yes, Interstellar. I have received quite a few emails from people asking me for my thoughts on this film. Definitely one of the most visually and emotionally powerful films I've ever seen. I know Ralph Rene would probably be peeved by the general relativity stuff it contained. But of the entire three hours of this movie, the reason people were so keen for my thoughts on the film was due to a scene that lasted less than a minute. Murph is a great kid. She's really bright, but she's been having a little trouble lately. She brought this in to show the other students the section on the lunar landings. Yeah, that's one of my old textbooks. She always loved the pictures. It's an old federal textbook. We've replaced them with the corrected versions. Corrected? Explaining how the Apollo missions were fake to bankrupt the Soviet Union. You don't believe we went to the moon? I believe it was a brilliant piece of propaganda that the Soviets bankrupted themselves, pouring resources into rockets and other useless machines. Useless machines? And if we don't want a repeat of the excess and wastefulness of the 20th century, then we need to teach our kids about this planet, not tales of leaving it. Ah yes, a future where the textbooks have been corrected to dispel the Apollo myth. That is a future we can all look forward to. You have no idea how aggravated I get that the textbooks still teach nonsense like the Apollo missions, or the giant impact theory. I have a 2012 textbook that I purchased last year for a planetary geology course that I did, and it has a section on the giant impact theory. No mention of the scientific papers on the water contents as high as 6,000 parts per million in the Apollo rocks, or the associated ferric iron. I was so pissed off that I almost ripped out that section of the book during the lecture to let everyone know what I thought of it. I want to hear nothing but ripping. We'll separate it. Put it on a roll. <laughs> not the Bible. You're not going to go to hell for this. <laughs> Make a clean tear. I want nothing left of it. What I did do, though, was give the convener a copy of my presentation on the Chang'e 3 geological data. But he was more skeptical of the Chinese than NASA. But I'm delving a bit off topic. The latest donation to my fundraise coincides with news on Space Adventure's Lunar Tourism Project. On June 23, 2014, the Moscow Times published an article titled Ross Cosmos Disavows Plan to Send Space Tourists to the Moon. Russia's space agency, Roscosmos, will not be involved in a plan to send two space tourists on a flight around the moon and it was not consulted about the project, the Federal Space Agency said. The mission, hatched by US-based space tourism firm Space Adventures and a major Russian spacecraft manufacturer, Energia Rocket and Space Corporation, would seize two space tourists travel to the moon aboard a modified Russian Soyuz spacecraft by 2017. However, Roscosmos was kept out of the loop on the plan. The organizers could have consulted with us before making such loud announcements, said Denis Lyskov, Roscosmos deputy chief in charge of piloted flights, is Vestia reported Monday. We are not participating in the moon project. We are not planning to modify the Soyuz, Lyskov was quoted as saying. Despite the government owning a 38% stake in Energia, 
The company has a history of asserting its independence from the space agency, which purchases its hardware from the company for use in the government space agenda. During the 1990s, Energeia at one point attempted to position itself as the rightful heir to the Soviet space program and negotiated directly with NASA for using the space station Mir before the government began to reconsolidate the space industry under its control. Roscosmos' exclusion from the Moon Project suggests that Energia may once again be looking to expand its own commercial niche. Already, the spacecraft builder sells launches of some of its spacecraft on the international market. Conceivably, Energia could unilaterally pursue a commercial lunar if its customers are willing to stump up the funds. Space Adventures chief Tom Shelley said in May that his company had already found two people who were willing to splurge on the $150 million tickets, according to MIT Technology Review. In early June, Energia CEO Vitaly Lapolto told Interfax that the company was working closely with Space Adventures to make the mission a reality, expressing his confidence that, We can do this. Circle the moon in 2017 to 2018 on Soyuz. Technically, it is possible. Shelley later reiterated Energia's commitment to providing Space Adventures with the necessary hardware to pursue a lunar flyby mission. We are basically taking the same Soyuz that flies to the space station, making a few modifications to allow it to go around the far side of the moon, and adding an extra habitation module to make it more comfortable for passengers, Shelley said, Spaceflight Now reported. Energia and Space Adventures have taken several tourists into Earth orbit and to the International Space Station, lending credibility to their promise to deliver a moon flight. But research director of the Institute for Space Policy at the Russian Academy of Sciences, Ivan Mulsev, said the moon project would cost no less than $1 billion, Ivestiev reported. Essentially, a new spaceship would need to be built, he said. But for us, even the simplest modernization takes years and takes up a lot of money. And everything needs to be tested first. You cannot send out a tourist right away. I had figured the Russian government would try to back out of sending a man to the moon. They always do. And that's despite Space Adventure's proposal being essentially an upgraded version of the Soviet's old Zond program, which sent stripped-down Soyuz capsules around the moon and back to the Earth. Zond 5 carried radiation extremophiles like turtles around the moon and back, and the unmanned Zond 7 was considered flight-worthy for humans. But the Soviets never manned the capsule. I have no doubt that the reason they never manned it was because, as they told Sir Bernard Lavelle in 1963, they were postponing manned moon missions indefinitely until they could find adequate ways of shielding their cosmonauts from solar flares. The Space Adventures Lunar Flyby, or Deep Space Exploration Alpha Mission as it's called, is very similar to the Zonda program. Only instead of a stripped down Soyuz, it uses a full Soyuz spacecraft comprising of all three modules. Zond had no orbital module. Zond was also launched with a proton rocket for a direct ascent approach around the moon. Deep Space Alpha uses an Earth orbit rendezvous approach, launching the Soyuz and its tourists atop the usual R7 rocket, and then dock with an Earth departure stage called Block DM, launched by a separate Zenit rocket. With the Russian Space Agency standing down, it seems that if DSE Alpha is to take off, it will be a 100% private venture between Space Adventures and the Energia Corporation. Again, I suspect that the reason the Russian Space Agency is back down is due to the radiation hazard, but it seems the mission probably wouldn't have worked anyway, even if there was no radiation hazard. In his Encyclopedia Astronautica article, Mark Wade argues that the required Block DM, with all its docking modifications and avionics, would be outside the lifting capacity of the Zenit rocket, and he instead opts for doing a repeat of the Zond missions, a direct ascent via the Proton rocket. Actually, in order for this mission to work, the Soyuz would need to be docked with a shelter module surrounded by 2 meters of water. That would bring the craft to a total mass of at least 116 tons. The heat shield would also of course need to be thickened to withstand the re-entry speeds, though I'm not quite sure how much extra mass it would introduce. To be conservative, we'll consider a mass of the lock variation of the Soyuz. Now the craft is 119 tons. Sending that to the moon would require 238 tons of propellant. Well, that's a lot more than the Block DM can hold. And far beyond the lifting capacity of the Proton, or any rocket that Russia has ever built for that matter. 
The largest rocket the Russians ever built was Valentin Glushko's Energia rocket. It could lift 105 tons and was used to launch space shuttle Buran. It also had the power to launch lunar payloads, but its limit was 35 tons. Interestingly, if you do the math, we find that the Lok Soyuz, LK Lander, and Block D stage combined all have the combined mass of nearly 35 tons, which is within the lunar lifting capacity of the Energia. With that in mind, the Soviets could have potentially used the Energia to replace the ill-fated N1 rocket as the launch vehicle in Korolev's L3 moon program. In fact, Glushko had his own plans for a moon program using Energia. And supposedly, former NASA Administrator Daniel Golden was considering using Energia for George H.W. Bush's broken promise of a return to the moon. But, surprise surprise, Energia was never used for anything other than Earth orbit launches. But I'm delving off track. The bottom line is that Russia simply doesn't have, nor has it ever had, a rocket powerful enough to send a Soyuz to the moon, unless it is without the shelter module. If they are ever to send a man to the moon, using their own rockets, then they'd be best off resurrecting Vladimir Chelomai's long since rejected UR-700M project. Without getting into too much detail, back in the 1950s and 1960s, there were many different groups of people competing for contracts for various Soviet space programs. Prominently, the Special Design Bureau No. 1, or OKB-1, led by Sergei Korolev, and OKB-52, led by Vladimir Chalomai. Both bureaus competed fiercely for space contracts, and both groups of people had to come up with very different proposals for a manned moon mission. Korolev had proposed a gigantic liquid-fueled rocket as large as the Saturn, called the N-1, to send the Lok Soyuz and LK lander to the moon. Unlike the Saturn, which was a three-stage rocket, the N-1 was a five-stage rocket. The first three stages would get the payload and the upper stages into Earth orbit. The fourth stage was the Earth departure stage, to send it to the Moon. And the fifth stage, the Block D, would be used to enter lunar orbit and de-accelerate the LK enough to begin its descent to the Moon. Chelomai's team, on the other hand, had proposed a much shorter, but much more powerful rocket called the UR-700. It would have comprised of a massive hypergolic rocket core comprising of three rockets strapped together, which in turn were surrounded by six strap-on hypergolic boosters. Unlike Korolev, Chelomai opted for a direct ascent approach to the moon. Three cosmonauts would travel to the moon aboard the LK-700 spacecraft, land on the moon, and later ascend and return to Earth in the same spacecraft. The UR-700 could lift 151 tons to Earth orbit, versus the N-1's 95 tons. Despite the inferior lifting capacity, Korolev's rocket won the contract. The UR-700 was ultimately downgraded into the UR-500, better known as the Proton Rocket. Work on the UR-700 only resumed in 1966, when the N-1 fell behind schedule, but was canned two years later. In January 1969, Chelomai proposed an even larger rocket, the UR-900, for manned Mars missions. Though by 1972, this proposal evolved into an even larger rocket, the UR-700M. Taking the technology of the UR-700 a step further, this massive rocket, which would have dwarfed both the Saturn V and the N-1, would have had a lifting capacity of 750 tons. In retrospect, if resurrected, this rocket could potentially send man around the moon aboard the Soyuz for real. Because a rocket's payload to the moon is a third of its payload to Earth orbit, that means the UR-700M could send about 250 tons to the moon. That's more than enough to send the Soyuz and the shelter module on its circumlunar flight with a single launch. But as far as I can tell, Russia has no current plans for such a rocket. In September 2014, Russia Today reported that Vladimir Putin approved the plans for a new Russian-built super-heavy rocket with a lifting capacity of 150 tons to Earth orbit which is slightly more than Elon Musk's proposed Falcon 20. But that won't get the Soyuz and the shelter module to the moon, unless some way can be found to strap such super-heavy rockets together, or if the propellant is sent up over several launches to fill up the tanks. In any case, it seems just as well that I switched over to SpaceX for my ride. 
after converting from euros to US dollars, the total amount of funds raised is $498.81 US. $1.19 more, and I'll be 1,000th of the way there. Only $499,501.19 to go.